everyone. So um, I'm Maggie Wu. I'm from the Department of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia. Among the Makonde people who live in southeastern coastal Tanzania, cassava is a staple of their diet. Traditional food here is cassava only, I was told over and over again by many Sunday villagers. Based on ethnographic fieldwork in Tanzania between June and August 2011, the following presentation asks the question of how cassava became the most commonly named traditional food in Sunday. What are the processes behind this? And what does it mean to be uh, for it to be traditional for local peoples? So um, Sinde, the village I was working at, is just down in the south by Matwara. The closest town is Matwara here. So I will first briefly, very briefly, trace the social history of cassava's journey from its um, domestication in the Amazon basin to its presence simmering in a pot of coconut milk over a three stone fire in a backyard kitchen in coastal Tanzania and how its history becomes embedded in the eating experience. And through doing so, I compare two different perspectives. Um, uh, the perspective uh, as seen in development discourses as a tool of development um, with uh, Sydney's villagers' uh, conception of cassava as a food of poverty, weakness, and hunger. So Mint's discussion of sugar in, in the making of an industrial capitalist world system, Nash, uh, uh, Nancy Shepard Hughes exploration of the legacy of inequality from sugar plantations in Brazil, and Carney's uh, discussion of plant and knowledge diffusion in the shadow of the transatlantic slave trade, all elaborate on how different food products transformed eating practices, modified landscapes, how, and how people related to each other and the movement of food and people and the construction of cash crops. Food is political, a political gastronomy, if you will, and embody historic and contemporary social relationships between Africa, the Americas, and Europe, between masters, slaves, uh, workers, and factory owners. Foods do not just represent um, the process of transitioning to an industrial world system, but was a part of it. However, all three authors emphasize the transatlantic world um, in association to the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, shifting attention, this presentation focuses onto the dynamic and deeply historical Indian Ocean world and the Swahili people today who live on the Afri uh, East African coast. Like Mintz, the discussion of sugar, and like Mintz's discussion of sugar, cassava in Africa has a history steeped in colonialism. Cassava, sometimes called uh, manioc in the Americas and also called tapioca in Asia, was originally from South America. Archaeological findings suggest that, that it, is, has been, it was domesticated in the Amazon region uh, between 5000 and 7000 BCE. Cassava grows well in a wide range of landscapes, from sea level to 7,000 feet, in fertile soils, in poor soils. Um, it is drought resistant and produces more food by weight per unit of land than any other tropical plant. From the Amazon basin, it has spread to become a very important staple around the world. Cassava was brought um, by Portuguese ships to the uh, west coast of Africa in the 16th century and later to the east coast through Madagascar and Zanzibar in the 18th century. While cassava was grown on the coast, it wasn't widely grown in East Africa until the 19th and 20th century when it spread into the interior with the encouragement of German and British colonial powers who saw that cassava was an effective um, famine reserve crop. British colonial authorities uh, promoted cassava as a means of development and was involved in developing better strains of cassava. Research programs were set up in various countries, such as the Armani Research Station in Tanzania, set up in, by the British between 1935 and 1957. So colonial governments may be gone, but cassava production today um, continues to be encouraged by some development organizations. For example, um, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the, uh, the United Nations, FAO, and this is just one of them, I'm just giving an example, um, sees cassava as uh, an answer to Africa's problems. As written in a document in Cassava in Africa, they say that Africa is a continent in crisis. It is racked with hunger, poverty, and the HIV AIDS pandemic. Africa is also the region with the fastest population growth 
the most fragile natural resources base, the weakest set of agricultural research and extension institutions. Cassava has the potential to increase farm incomes, reduce rural and urban poverty, and help close the uh, food gap. Without question, cassava holds great promise for feeding Africa's uh, growing population. Cassava, called Africa's food savior by some, is considered an effective survival crop on a continent painted as full of people uh, living on the brink of survival. In addition, um, cassava becomes a tool for development. In the same document um, by FAO in 2005, they discuss four stages of cassava transformation, from cassava as a famine reserve crop, mostly for home consumption, to a rural food staple, then as a cash crop for urban consumption, and lastly, cassava for international export as livestock feed and industrial raw material. From stages one to four, there's, a technology, devel uh, there's technology development generally from land hoe, uh, hand hoe, using family labor to hired help, and finally mechanized monoculture agriculture. Technology development includes genetic improvement to high yielding varieties suitable for medical, uh, <laughs> a mechanical harvest and peeling, and consequently standardizing seed distribution from farmer and farmer exchange to private seed companies. The stages of cassava transformation reflect social evolutionist paradigms, which imply that human societies progress through stages from tradition to modernity. The four stages of um, cassava transformation describe a unilinear development via technology and involvement with global markets and cash economies. Modernity is achieved through increasing complexification where the sphere of relations, often economic, are increasingly expanded to a global arena. Additionally, the development of cassava production aims to transform African societies at its foundation of eating habits, from rural subsistence practices to an urban uh, working population needing quick calories on the go. The stages detail uh, development of food products from roots eaten fresh to convenient prepared food products. Industrial production of cassava starch is intended as a syrup for the soft drink industry and for making beer. The promotion of cassava uh, reveals a his history of colonialization and also politics of contemporary development within a neoliberal framework where modernity is, um, is equated with integration with global markets. In contrast to, develop, uh, to global discourses that promote cassava as a tool for development, Sindhi villagers view cassava as a traditional food. Similar to development discourses, cassava is valued locally as a drought-resistant plant that can be grown in the sandy soils of coastal Tanzania. However, rather than a tool for development, Sindhi villagers see dependence on a famine reserve crop as commentary of their social marginalization from resources and power from colonialization to present day. Though cassava is widely grown in Sindhi, it's conceptualized as a food of weakness, ill health, and hunger. For example, when I asked people what foods are considered good for health, people said a variety of food items, including rice, beans, pigeon peas, potatoes, green vegetables, bananas, papaya, and fish. However, on foods that can cause weakness, all participants agreed on ugali wa muhogo, which is stiff porridge made from cassava flour. A male elder of the village, Mze Hamadi, said, the food that causes weakness to the human body is ugali wa mihogo. It does not provide anything for, to the human body. It does not provide any health. We are just eating it so we can protect ourselves from death because hunger can cause death. A mother of three, Mama Hadija, expanded to also include kasambu, which are cassava leaves. Ugali wa mihogo causes weakness to the human body because if a child or adult uses ugali wa mihogo, they will get diarrhea. Kasambu causes fever. Some people, when they eat kasambu, they feel gas in their stomachs. Even myself, when I eat kasambu, my stomach becomes full of gas, and the next morning when I get up, I get diarrhea but I continue to eat because we have a shortage of food. In this village, we have a lot of diarrhea, so this happens many times. Both development discourses and local villagers see cassava as a food to prevent hunger and starvation. 
However, while colonial powers and development discourses see cassava as a part of the solution, giving vital calories needed to save lives, Sindhi villagers saw cassava as representative of the problem of hunger. For local villagers, cassava represents empty calories, which is nutritionally accurate. Cassava roots are mainly starch and malnutrition can occur even if a person feels full but lacks vital macronutrients such as fats and proteins and are micronutrients such as vitamins and minerals. Mama Hadija's quote reveals that cassava is associated with the two biggest problem, health problems in the village, diarrhea and fevers caused by malaria. On the one hand, it can be considered metaphoric to relate cassava to Maisha Magumu, a hard life. However, on the other hand, it is a very real association. A diet of cassava roots lacks many vitamins and minerals, including vitamin, day, a, <laughs> vitamin A, which is required for mucus secreting cells in the body. The body's first defense against um, respiratory and uh, gastrointestinal infections, so diarrheal diseases. Cassava leaves, while high on vitamin A, are also seasonal and mainly eaten during rainy season when malaria mosquitoes are more prevalent. A household that subsists on cassava leaves and roots tend to be poor and probably cannot afford a mosquito net or even a proper bed to tuck the mosquito net into. Baba Haji, an owner of a small shop in the village, further reveals the association of cassava with poverty. He said, I started my business 15 years ago, and in the beginning, if you kept rice, cassava flour, and maize flour, you would sell more cassava flour followed by maize flour, because at that time, people did not have enough money. After many years, some projects came into the area and gave people aid. They gave uh, nets for fishing, and after that, people started to eat different things. They could eat whatever they wanted. They may eat rice. Baba Haji vividly describes how cassava flour uh, was sold the, uh, sold the most when people did not have m enough money. According to Baba Haji, government aid in the past had provided fishing nets, which allowed people to prosper and eat whatever they wanted. Prosperity was not conveyed um, as eating a variety of different seafoods, but rather that people were able to sell the fish and buy any food that they wanted, namely rice. His comment, which might have been targeted specifically at me as a foreigner doing research in the village, suggested that people here are not opposed to development, countering a stereotype that southeastern Tanzanians are development unfriendly, but rather that they want development that works for them instead of in spite of them. So development and progress is translated to maendeleo in Kiswahili, which literally means going forward, and has a special history in Tanzania with President Nerere's socialist government um, from 1962 to 1985 post-independence. Within the framework of maendeleo, traditional is non-modern or backwards. Traditional in Kiswahili translates to asili, of olden days, or utamanduni, cultural, the latter which often refers to tribal identities. There are 120 different tribes in Tanzania, and while cultural background is a strong part of contemporary identities, nation building in Tanzania emphasizes principles of unity. As ethnic identities are largely constructed through language different, uh, different languages, ideals of unity were constructed through a common language, Kiswahili. Kiswahili is taught through primary school, and education is seen as a social marker for Maendeleo. Education served as a crucial social fault line, uh, fault line because it provided a pr the principal entry of employment in government and private sector and because it also uh, serves symbolically to mark those who are considered more developed from those less so. However, education is unequally spread through Tanzania because um, education in the British colonial policy was mainly under the domain of Christian missionaries and consequently marginalized um, Muslim coastal areas. Uh, one day during a long and bumpy bus ride from Etwara, um, back to Dar es Salaam, I overheard a conversation on what is the best country. One man jokingly replied Moshi, which is a city in northern Tanzania, because there he said that it was uh, paved to your toilet, meaning that there has been a lot of development there. 
um, and that southeastern Tanzania seemed like a completely different comp uh, country in comparison. A common understanding of development is in less in stages, such as revealed in the um, stages of cassava transformation, but rather of tangible things in technology and infrastructure associated with development countries to make their lives easier and serve um, as potential sources for upward mobility. Mindaleo meant electricity, clean, fashionable clothing, houses of manufactured uh, materials, including cinderblock bricks, um, better transportation, improved roads, and secondary schools. However, within Mandaleo lies a tension for Swahili people. While on the one hand, the use of Kiswahili as a unifying language in the, new, uh, in the nation of Tanzania testifies to Swahili influence in East Africa and the pride in Swahili history and civilization, formal education and other signifiers of de um, development have been largely focused inland to the exclusion of Swahili peoples who are seen as trapped in nostalgia for their golden past. However, in contrast to development um, discourses where globalization and, is, uh, and involvement in the global market are seen as associated to modernity, Swahili people consider themselves to be globalized and cosmopolitan long before the 15th century European um, exploration. Islam is used um, by people in Sindh to represent their connection to the wider world and a rich history. Sindhi villagers' preference for rice over cassava is linked to consuming the histories of these foods. Cassava is linked to European colonialization with increasing European influence and a focus on land territories rather than the interconnectedness of the Indian Ocean. As cassava was and continues to be promoted as a famine reserve crop, it is connected to the problems of drought, poverty, and the need to reserve against famine. Cassava is traditional for local villagers in Sinde in the sense that it is the opposite of Maendeleo. Cassava is a crop that villagers hope to move forward from to a diet more based on rice. So I'm actually going to stop there because I'm running out of time. So thank you. <laughs> The, the, I put this picture up because he's pretending to be, a, um, these are kids that were pretending to be cattle and it just brings back memories for me. <laughs> were there any questions? Yes? I Some strains of cat, they're like, there's issues mo with mosaic disease, um, which I believe is viral. I didn't see any in the village that I worked at, um, but it might, maybe it's coming. Okay, thanks. Uh, we'll move on. Uh, thank you very much. Amy,